Good evening. Hello. Welcome, everyone. I'm Jen Maxey, Assistant Director of Public Programs at the Skirball Cultural Center in Los Angeles. We are a museum and a cultural center rooted in Jewish values to honor memory, seek learning, and build community. And of course, we always love to break bread together, which brings me to our program tonight, a celebration of Jake Cohen's cookbook, Jew-ish, Reinvented Recipes from a Modern Mensch, and if you were anywhere near Instagram during this whole last year, then maybe you came upon Jake. His shows were delightful from his own kitchen. And he is also a former Savora staffer, a food editor for Time Out New York, a test kitchen director for Feed Feed. Jake is also a writer for Food 52, Food and Wine, and Real Simple. So he's here tonight to talk about his debut cookbook which merges recipes from his own Ashkenazi Jewish background with those of his husband Alex's Persian Iraqi Jewish traditions. So this cookbook is not only filled with delicious recipes, but it's really a love letter to cross-cultural blending, as well as honoring the ancient alongside embracing the modern. So here to talk with Jake tonight is none other than the 2018 James Beard Foundation Book Award winner, Michael Twitty. Michael is an author, culinary historian, and historical interpreter. Michael's award-winning book, The Cooking Gene, explores African-American cuisine in the Old South. And as Michael has said, cooking puts you in the presence of our ancestors. We are so thrilled and honored to welcome both Jake and Michael tonight. So Michael, take it away. Right, awesome. I am thrilled to be here with you again, Jake. Um, it's, it's, I think that it's very powerful that during Pride Month, we have um, not only ourselves, but Liz Alpern and many others who are the, the representatives of an entire tradition. I, I, I've, I've always kind of thought to myself, as much grief as, as people give queer people for being the end of the line, the destruction of all of it, in, in the cultures that I inhabit, the spaces I inhabit, Black and Jewish spaces, and in Jewish spaces and other spaces, it just, it seems like the queer people are, the, are, as we say in West Africa, the griots, the storytellers, the holders of memory, the keepers of tradition. And that's so powerful. Um, and your work certainly does that. So the first thing I wanna ask you, because I wanna ask you a lot of questions, um, is, You've, you've definitely chosen to embrace and love and promote um, Jewish food. You, and then what, of course, when we look at a lot of social media, people talk about Jewish food, it's one third complaining about how Jewish food is insufficient. How, especially Ashkenazi Jewish food is not interesting or it's neutral colors, it's brown, it's gray, and it's blah, whatever. Um, and I wanna talk to you about Alex and the, Mizrahi traditions that you have integrated into your work and become a part of in a minute. But I right now I want to talk to you, to ask you three questions in one. Yeah. One is where did where does your family come from? Um, because I was uh, we got to talk about roots. I'm the roots guys. We talk about roots. Two is why do you why do you hug the Ashkenazi food tradition the way you do? Because I, I I I have my reason for saying hell yeah, but you have yours. And third is how do you integrate this? You did a beautiful job of integrating um, sort of like the professional, current, contemporary food world with tradition, and not just this like idea of this three thousand year old tradition thing, but tradition that is American Jewish. I know I asked a lot. Speak, you know, spill your tea and speak to all of that, please. I love it. I love it. I mean, I would expect nothing less from you in terms of, of questions. Uh, really. Um, so in terms of the family, very obviously, like on my paternal side, they were in what is now Russia, then Poland. Um, and my great grandmother came who is i knew and grew up with she was born in 1898 and came to the states when she was seven um and so i grew up and she lived until 102 um, or 103 so she made it to three she made it to the new millennia so she lived in the 1800s 1900s and 2000s which is like wild 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 um but 
that was that side. So my grandmother, who I was very close with, um, grew up in Brooklyn and she was a truly like one of, she passed last year and and she was someone who I was incredibly close with my husband was incredibly close with and she was a poor Jewish girl from Brooklyn who had a was a single mother and didn't go to college until my father went to college and went on to get her masters and like had big dreams and ended up on 5th Avenue living it up and her journey to Judaism um, was very, it's funny because like it wasn't until she passed that I I found all these documents when we were cleaning out her apartment. Um, And one of which was this like, when she went to, she went to Fordham for her master's, she she did a like a life project where you write a a book if you're an older person to um, get credit and reading it and kind of seeing some stories of her going to temple which is funny because we would do like high holidays together but it was never she wasn't very jewish in that way especially when it came to food she the most jewish she would would drop a lot of yiddish but she was very much like a and she left that life behind in order to have this like new dream of of the like new york life but on the other side on my maternal side um my grandfather it was um Hildenberg. Uh, the last name's Heilberg, which is tied to where they were from in Germany. Um, my grandmother um, came from. She also was. They both were raised in Belgium, though. Um, both my grandparents. I actually just had dinner with my grandmother last week, and I made made her tell me the the cities. Her her father was from Vilno, Lithuania, and her mother was from Wierosvo, Poland. It's spelled all the spelling never makes any sense. Like her last. Her maiden name was Shabulski, but sorry, with like a PRS. Like it really, all of it is 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 out there. So really, the 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 quick way to put it is all over Eastern Europe, um, and they all ended up in New York, in the city, and that's where my grandparents met. Um, it's where my my parents met. It's where my whole family lives. It's where I was born and raised. Um, so New York is home. And when we talk about then that tie to Ashkenazi food, um, really that is all I've known. When you look at New York culture, so much of it is Ashkenazi food. However, that being said, I, I think the, the bigger conversation is you look at like all these dishes that are so inherently Ashkenazi and so proudly beige, so proudly stereotypical are celebrated in New York, but in a specific category in deli and in in appetizing and things that are are not fancy that are still pretty much tied in terms of that aesthetic the the poor aesthetic um Mm. that we came from poverty in eastern europe and even in new york if we are going to even i mean i just think of like the russian daughters family i think of 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 uh nikki and, and and josh and at the end of the day it's like they're doing so well and have created this empire but it's still around the idea of like herring and fish and 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 it's not necessarily considered high society foods um and i guess i've always had that disconnect of why why does that have to be why do we see this in so many other cultures i think um western society makes these choices of what cultures get to be absorbed into the the european aesthetic of of high society and class and fine dining what's Um, what's what? And what's valued, and yet, when when it's hungry, it goes to the deli. When it's hungry, it goes to the soul food place. When it's hungry, it goes to the Chinese place, and, and so on. Hungry, it's when it's spiritual, when it's tied to tradition, when it's tied to 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 community. Right, I, that's, I, that's that's the hunger. It's not just like the belly. It's it's like, oh my god, how much mayonnaise can I take? <laughs> like, exactly. what's going on like that kind of hunger that kind of beautiful that kind of spiritual hunger wow so so how so so you but you would you take those you take this tradition which in america is you know of course our our mutual godmother joe nathan and Faye well, Lee. i finally got to meet in person two weeks ago that's so you know, do you know how you know how long i've known that lady <laughs> only because we're in each other's backyard I, I got embarrassed 20 some years ago. Wow. Mm, God, Lord, uh, you know, I, I know I'm an altacaca, but that's a whole different story. 
Um, but I look, but I look at you, and I am like look, these people have laid down this foundation that Jewish, the knowledge of Jewish food in America and beyond, is so much richer than the, than the things that people commonly you know, like you talked about. But what you do, which I think is very, um, really, really special, is that you take your professional background. You know, the, you and I both come from different parts of this whole culinary experience. You're far more in the kitchen than I am, um, at least in a, at least in that sort of like. This is what you do. This is how you do it. These are these are creative ideas, and and you take that and you marry that, and you 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 be, you've been able to lift up and out those ideas about Jewish food through your work. Can you talk to me a little bit about that that whole process? Um, it's all with the intention of not so subliminal Judaism. I just think that we live in the society where where I came about through this back end of traditional media where I was really like in the same, I just truly believe I was born at the right time and I'm just the perfect age because I was able to be on the very tail end of print media and then come into digital and then come into social. And with that, the things that I saw, it's always like we're one giant advertising agency. Really, it's like editorial is nothing, but like we are trying to tell people why they should care about blank. And typically, it's just determined by like the top chefs in the country that start to cook these things. And then we as journalists start to see the trends, start to see these things that we find interesting and want to blow it up on our platform so the world can start to take note. And then it trickles down and ends up in fast food chains and, and at Costco and all, all of that stuff. Um, but- to quote, to, quote, to quote one of our greatest rabbis, um, um, it's Cerulean. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Just like Devil Wears Prada, it's no different in really any type of editorial function. Um, so I think when I started writing about Jewish food, which is really something like one of the things that I, I, I will always give credit to when it comes to social media was social media was the first place where I really could be myself. Where in food media, and again, it's like I say this as, as a like white man in food media with everyone else but the idea of being jewish and the idea that like the things that i faced in terms of anti-semitism and the the kind of way this, that people have spoken to me at different editorial jobs which is still blows my mind that that's happening today um and the gatekeepers in terms of who can tell jewish stories and what jewish stories are allowed to be told and there was always like you had one little window at Passover, one little window at, at Hanukkah, and everything else you go fuck yourself. Like they're really like that was pretty that, much. That's no, it. Pretty much. Hey, look, look. The, now I get the double blessing of Passover, Hanukkah, Black History Month, and now it's Juneteenth. Day <laughs> Juneteenth, right? The, like the, like the idea. People need to understand that this is not a democracy in terms of how marginalized cultures are presented. And I'm gonna correct you. You kind of off white. So, so you, know, you ain't lost white. You got an off white. But, but like, can I can I can I get one quick example of if you feel comfortable? Because yeah. I, you know, I have no problem telling people's tea. One quick example of something something or ish that made you go, why did you have to say that? Why did you have to you know behave in that way? Why why is anti-Semitism creeping into this particular space? I mean, listen, it comes as down to like there were I had moments with one editor with comments that would come up often about when change was on the floor about picking it up. Um, I had one editor that put up a scriptures calendar in my cubicle, joking that I needed Jesus like it was it, it's just the things that that truly we're seeing again today in, in this current state of like microaggressions or aggression aggressions. Um, to Jews are just not taken seriously. Um, and it's that, I mean, it's like the, the, the book, like Jews don't count. And that's, that's truly how um, we're made to feel. And, and it is what it is in, in the sense of these are, are terrible things that happen. But um, to me, it's only fueled this desire to be more so myself and in, in, in a very similar parallel way i'm like we're obviously in pride right now and this idea of queerness and unapologetically queer yet um 
we're constantly being asked to be apologetic for being Jews, um, constantly. And, and that's something that I think comes up a lot with me and a lot of my friends in the, the, the restaurant space. Um, one friend particularly went to culinary school together. He's worked at, at French laundry and per se and single thread. And, and we were, were chatting a few months ago, literally in my lobby because he was talking through his, his, connection to family and his grandfather owned a, a Jewish bakery in, um, in Brooklyn. And it's not until we started to explore these aspects of ourselves um, when it comes to family recipes, Jewish food, that we start to make connections and realize that that so much of our identity has been kept from us. Um, and a lot of that came from just the, the secularization and assimilation when the Jews came to America. And it's such a blessing that our generations get to grow up with relative freedom um, of expression, but with that came a great deal of disconnect to that identity and to that story and to that uh, that concept of, of joy around our identity. And when we finally start to dive into that and explore it, it's very emotional because you, for the first time, start to feel like you see yourself in your work. You start to see yourself in other people's work. You start to find pride in a way that you never have before because you've been taught in in culinary school and three Michelin star restaurants what is deemed good food, what is deemed food that is worthy of 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 high prices or of accolades or of everything. And it's never our food and it's never the foods that we have grown up with associating with nostalgia associating with comfort associating with family and something that's become really important to me is as i started to explore it becomes like these floodgates because once you open it you start to realize that every as aspect of our lives whether it's like big or small, is somehow touched by Jewish values that have slowly trickled down and secularized into just the way that we act with our families and with our communities and with everything. Um, and, and when you start to kind of make those connections of, oh, your aunt's not just quirky, it's not just like that your mother is, is crazy, it's that these are all connected to the bigger picture of who we are as a community. And it's it's kind of wild when you start to realize that. I think, I think that it's, for me, it's been a two way street. I, I need to have this convers this recorded conversation for my, for my next book, Coach of Soul, because I think a lot of what I've been trying to convince people about is that so many things that we've said in the past 10 minutes, like you've made a point about the, like that, like that poverty food aesthetic thing. And like, I'm, it's, it's not just that we're just like all over the place. These things have their own roots. These social situations, these are the values behind the food. I try to tell people the same thing about African-American food. Mm -hmm. I've been asked like, is, cause your next book's just a Jewish book. I said, no, it's a black book. Cause blacks are Jews. Yeah. And oh yes, and so, well, that's oh, it's, what you're doing now is like a black book. No, it's a Jewish book because these traditions that I'm talking about, some of which are Southern Jewish and several years old and some several hundred years old and some of which, um, as I've said before, these two communities were part of the two original sins of the West, the first being anti-Semitism, the second being anti-Blackness, which bloomed into other racisms. When you have two marginalized people who are pushed to the edge all the, at the same time for uh, 2000 plus years in the Western world, the Romans onward, do you really think they're not living in the same place at the same time, cooking some of the same food together? Like for real, they're making culture. There was the reason why, you know, when the world needed to be saved, they picked Will Smith and Jeff Goldblum. You know, <laughs> and they, 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 they didn't pick no walls to do it. Oh no, we got to pick the ones who have been that's saving awesome. our tuckuses since day one. So all that, all that's fantastic because it's the same conversation, just in a different vein. And for me, like I think one of the most beautiful parts about it, I get to remind people who. Um, maybe don't have that information or aren't connected to it. Jewish food is a 3,500 year old cuisine and it's global. It's not just one thing. It's, oh, it's yeah. all, this and all of our migrations. So speaking of migration and intersections, you have a love, you, you all are a lovely couple. Um, I, la I laugh every time I see you on TikTok and on Instagram because like you up here and he right now, huh? It's, I mean, 
which is funny because he's like normal height and I'm just like freakishly tall. People all people assume that it's the other way around. But yeah. <laughs> so I mean, well, tall tall Jewish boys. This this, this is this is an odd thing in my world. Um, but Alex comes. Um, we me and my husband have made uh, your mother in law's rice. I don't know how many times we made it for Pesach, and everybody went crazy. I mean, like it's a staple now. So um, Persian and Iraqi background, and one of the most uh, one of the things that I was really touched by was when you wrote in the introduction to Jewish. Um, by the way, you might want to pay uh, Marjorie some some money for the money to uh, since she proved her laser theory. I was yeah. like, this fool got lasers up in the picture. I was like, I know you did that picture before this whole thing went down, but it worked out. It worked out. Worked out. So you said this was a love letter. Yeah. To him and to I. I just I just want you to expound upon that and the influence that um, his traditions have made on your your vision of Jewish cooking. So it's funny because you think of so many stories of the evolution of Jewish food. And one of the, the arguments, I would say the main argument in my book of what makes it different from a lot of past Jewish cookbooks is it, it's different eras. And we think of like the era of Jewish trauma and how food evolved based on are fleeing and having to resettle in a new location with new ingredients and new dishes and how we adapted, which is not that far away. I think of my husband's grandparents who were born and raised in Iraq, had to flee Iraq to Israel where my mother-in-law was born, and then they settled in Iran, and then they had to flee Iran from the revolution. And in each of these places, the food evolves. They're Iraqi, so the way that they learned and cooked Persian food was with Arab influence, um, with the idea of like, what do Iraqi Jews use? And that also involves a lot of Indian influence since the Iraqi Jews were so crucial with the spice trade with India. So she's cooking Persian dishes with Iraqi techniques and she's making Iraqi dishes now with Persian ingredients. And then this all gets another layer when they come to New York and have to do that all over again with what is available in America. She was also, her first husband was Turkish and so she lived in Turkey for a while. So they're, so they are, oh, she has Turkish Jewish recipes mixed in. <laughs> stories of Jewish communities everywhere in the same way that we talk so candidly about um, Ashkenazi foods like brisket and how they've evolved in America where like in the Midwest, you'll see people adding ketchup and no one blinks or Coca-Cola in the South and Yet the idea of Jewish food evolving in this current age where I'm saying we're moving from trauma to joy um, is somehow confusing to people, especially the generation that just had this happen. Um, and for me, the, this book is a love letter because my definition of Jewish food evolved when I met my husband. And we're not basing this on trauma, but just the joy of two Jewish families coming together with very different backgrounds. And we celebrate the same holidays and go through the same rituals, just with completely different menus. And there was something super powerful in that when you grow up in this bubble of the New York Ashkenazi world, in which not only are we surrounded by it ourselves but what we see in media what we see ourselves reflected in the definition of what is a jew who is a jew it's one larry david caricature and it's great growing up because you get to kind of see yourself and your family but what it does is it prevents you from understanding how global this definition of jew is is how global this definition of jewish food is and for me, like my husband was just the beginning. And then I wanted to actively search and explore what do Jewish communities around the world look like? What do they cook like? I'll never forget the first time I met um, Ashagar Araro, who's Black Jewish Magic on Instagram. And she, I met in her in Tel Aviv. Her aunt has this incredible Ethiopian restaurant called Balanjira. And she's telling the story of her aunt making this journey from Ethiopia to Israel and it's like I'm crying everyone is crying because it's so powerful and I'll never forget the fact that she was just that she said 
And the craziest part was they get to Israel, they get on the ground, they, they kiss the ground. And she said that her the first thing that shocked her aunt was she had no idea that there were white Jews. Hmm. That's all she knew. And, and the more you hear these stories, the stories that my mother-in-law tells me about what Rosh Hashanah was like in the traditions in in Iran. When I talked to my aunt about what Rosh Hashanah was like post-war, when my when part of my family um, had left Europe and actually landed in Havana, where my aunt was born and raised, and what the Cuban Jewish life was like, and you hear all of these stories, and it's just so broad, so absolutely like mesmerizing to think about like how far and wide the Jewish people reach and remember that we're only point what o2 mm-hmm. the world population the fact that we can touch so many cultures so many stories I mean for many people it's just they they get infuriated which is why this idea of what is Jewish food can be quite hard to define and like quite hard to to claim ownership on because we're not trying to claim ownership on we're just trying to claim what are the stories of our people and where we've gone and what things we have picked up to celebrate our traditions right because we're we are um this people who for whom meaning is the most important ingredient we Mm -hmm. sanctify time and space the way very few other people do we, when we talk about the meaningfulness, is the values is one level, but also the migrations. I love alliteration, sorry. And there's all these different, you know, points um, that inform the food and the fact that it, it can contain layers. So when you sit down to a Seder, a Seder is not a carbon copy of what was done, you know, thousands of years ago. A Seder is a lasagna. <laughs> A matzo lasagna, a megina of different pieces put together in experiences and stories. And it and it invites every story and every person to the table. This, the Seder is where I learned about as a family from the Cohen family who um, I think they, they made um, Aliyah, but um, they lived for quite some time in Potomac, Maryland. And so going to the Seder, they went to the Orthodox synagogue there Best show them. And, you know, for them, stories about like when the husband, his grandfather came to Mexico City. And they're talking about, well, the czar was going to put all these little boys at the front line. And so his grandfather, his, so his great grandfather basically said, wait a minute, I got this wrong. That was his grandfather. That would have been his great great grandfather basically hustled him into the shul. They had an impromptu, he's 12 and a half years old, bar mitzvah, semi-legal. And then he says, okay, tomorrow you're going on a train with so-and-so to Hamburg and you're going to get on a boat and you're going to go to your aunts and cousins who are living in a place called Mexico. And it happened within, that story, that story occurs within 36 hours. Yeah. We never saw his people again. And that's the thing I used to tell the kids in, in Hebrew schools, like you don't understand, you guys don't understand what it's like to, to have to say goodbye forever. No smartphone, no Instagram, no Twitter, no Facebook. You get on the damn plane or the boat and you never look back. And everything that you've ever had for the past however many thousand years, you've got to take with you somehow in here and in here and pass that on if you choose to. And so his wife talks, his wife brought this, you know, tremendous Mexican Passover turkey and mole sauce and and made me furious because she was talking about taquitos with grebenes in them. Oh, that's right? great. Right? Yeah. So that's that I mean, so, okay, so I gotta make, so we gotta figure that out, man. We gotta do one of the little Instagram videos you'd be doing with all these hundreds <laughs> of people watching. We got we to figure out how to make these. To, I got to see if I can find her again so we can make re- recreate these taquitos with gribbiness. You know, mm. that's, that sounds too good, right? I want to let everybody know in the audience, I haven't said this because I'm too excited about talking to my brother here, 
that the Q&A is where we're gonna, we want you to put your questions and answers. And so for the last uh, 12 or so minutes of this program, we're gonna try to tackle as many as possible spitfire. So please put your questions in the Q&A section and I will moderate them. So to that end, so, so two very important questions I think we have to get to before we do Q&A. Number one, as we said before, this is Pride Month. We are both uh, gay men in the food world. Um, we're both gay Jews in the food world. Who would have thought? Like we're this, you know, tiny percentage of the human race, and yet we we got it. We got it all. So um, one question I get a lot, which I am not going to answer tonight, but you're going to answer, is, and I think it's an I think it's kind of an obvious question, but people who are not us don't get it. It's two parter. One, what makes what makes food queer? What, what's, gay, what's gay food? Why, what, what's, what's this gay food stuff, right? And the, said by the very same people who can't eat enough oysters and send chocolates that, that are heart shaped on Valentine's they think it's only for them. What's gay food? And two, um, how does queerness and Jewishness intersect for you both personally and professionally? Yeah, um, to, so the, for the first question, for what makes food queer? I mean, that's always my favorite thing because um, gay people don't eat differently like that's the like we don't it's not like we, we have a different diet it's not we're different we don't come from a country this is not like this one place in which they're like a specific set of dishes that we do um that being said what makes food queer are it's all narrative based to me a queer food can never be queer food for the entire community other than like, I mean, I guess like the, the Lady Gaga Chromatica Oreos are maybe like an example of like a larger scale gay food. Um, but gay food is 100% on an individual level. I think of gay food, I think of, um, I think of French toast, which is the first dish that I made for Alex. I think of, mm -hmm. I think of the dish I put in my book for uh, these lamb chops that are marinated in uh, crushed grapes and garlic and sage that we had at our Ketuba signing dinner at Mizunon in Chelsea Market. I think of the foods that are connected to our moments of queerness, queer joy, queer celebration, queer forward moments and memories that are sanctified with food in ways that we sanctify most things with food we just don't consider things we don't put labels on that but i feel like everyone in the same way will have like what's your your sick day food what's your comfort food when you're having a, a really like you're in a rut what's your go-to meal when you want to celebrate something went really well like what's that restaurant you go to is it a steakhouse is it lobster everyone has these things we just have it around identity because of the fact that it's something that is very interesting in terms of how we have to come out and experience queerness and we're seeing this slowly disappear as the world becomes at least when i think of of the bubbles of more progressive areas of this country in which children are being raised with more understandings of the gender and sexuality spectrums that they get to just be themselves and maybe those concepts of what make food queer might slowly disappear because we aren't thinking about them being so different as queer people they're just like everyone else and all of a sudden it will just be like what are the foods we associate with love what are the foods that we associate with joy versus having to name them queer but right now we have to name them queer because it's a struggle it's an uphill battle just to have these moments of joy and then when I think about that and how it ties into Judaism, to me, it, it's, it, it comes down to the way that society talks to us. I've always made this comparison that, that think of like that slightly homophobic family member that you have to deal with at, at, a, at a family gathering and, and they'll just make the argument of like, well, it's like, I, I, don't, I don't really care if you guys are gay, but like, why do you have to be so gay in public why can't you just like save it for the bedroom and then which sounds, which sounds like 1950s be a man on the street and a jew in the home in the show but that's but and that's exactly what i was just gonna say that's how society still treats jews to these day to this day 
Why do you have to be so Jewish? And and the thing is, because of the fact that we, it, it's not as, for so many, it's not the same as, as, as being queer, clearly. Um, they have chosen to just, to agree to that. To just be like, you know what, that's fine. I will be a, a Jew at home and for my safety, no yarmulke, no talking, no no Yiddish words. Like, it will just be, mm-hmm. I'll be like everyone else, which is the, the, the idea that we and our culture aren't worthy of mainstream recognition, of mainstream value and 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 to me i think as we have seen this fight for queerness and queer culture and queer representation i demand the same for jewish and you look at things like things that like really grind my gears things like seinfeld the goldbergs on on tv these are shows that are so inherently jewish that never once say the word jewish Right. Or, or or one of my favorite movies, Avalon. Where you know, you know this is a this is a Jewish story, but that word never really appears. It's suggested. And it's it's almost like the same way in which, you know, we would we still, you and I, and um, a lot of other gay men in particular, will watch shows where you know that Disney character from way back when, not just today. Oh no no no! Was gay, or that person on that on that sitcom was gay, or the person in that drama was gay, but they never said the word gay. And there was and gay women, please, not, don't 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 exist. Uh, what's her name on Beverly Hillbilly? Never, no, she wasn't gay at all. Alice wasn't. You, you know, it's just it's just like it's just like you don't you don't you don't have that. And then you have these these horror. Well, I think they're horror stories of people like Billy Preston and Luther Vandross. And so many other people, they go, they go away, and yeah. and and no one knows that these were these were gifted gay people who contributed to society and to the world. You know, for me, I guess I have a slightly different answer um, to it, and that's that whenever when we were queerlings, we used to have anti Thanksgiving, where we would actually make rainbow. It was the day after Thanksgiving when we did not want to eat any Thanksgiving leftovers. And we made a food a different color of the rainbow flag, which would now be a little expanded. But that's how, that's one way we did it. But also the idea that I think for a lot of Jewish, Black, Latin, and other gay marginalized folks, um, it's we a lot of us didn't go to the basketball. I'm not being I'm trying not to be stereotypical, but it's true. For a lot of us, we didn't we weren't on the court, we weren't in the field. But we were in the kitchen with with Grandma and Bubby. Yeah, they were they were the people that saved us from absolute ruin, and because we were there, we we absorbed the memories, the stories, the foods, that how to do things, and the fact that some people might associate that with our you know our unique identities. That's cool. It doesn't always work out that way, but yes, I do feel that. I do feel like that that presence. And I did. Re- I do remember meeting a gentleman one time who wanted to work with me, um, you know, with my living history stuff because he was doing a play, and I don't know if how it happened to it, but it was a cool thing. It was him in drag, representing the stories of his mother and grandmother. Love that Jewish New York kitchen. And I just thought that is that's how this works. We these stories they 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 cross weave. So there's some couple of questions we're going to get to, but one question I want to make sure I ask. Um, this book, uh, I, I, I was skeptical. I, I like, I know you and I, I did you and everything, but I was like, okay, let me see how, how is he really going to like move this mark on this Jewish book? I mean, is he really going to do it? You know, I got all the books, right? You know, I got the same books you got. Yeah. 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 And, um, I was impressed and I actually was, I was so impressed that I actually made food from a damn cookbook that I bought <laughs> instead of it just sitting there looking pretty. And I think we made for Pesach, uh, uh, the Instagram, I think we made the um, the potatoes with with uh, baharat yeah. and we made um, some of the lamb chops and other things. We did, we did, we did a little of everything from the book. And I was so impressed with the, 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 the biggest hit was the cumin roasted carrots. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, uh, people need to buy this book. I'm going to just say it for you. Um, because I think it's a different chapter in the story of American Jewish food, but not just that. 
the story of Jewish food, plural, and what you talk about Jewish joy, um, that the opposite of our trauma is celebrating our culture and, and being full of it. Um, so I wanna ask you a question. So this is the question I ask everybody. Number one, Shabbat, two-parter. You know, we never ask, I used to, I used to get up mad at my kids at Hebrew school. They would say, well, I have two questions. I said, it's never one question, right? No. So the question is one, Shabbat dinner, what are the must-haves? And two, which actually is kind of in reverse, ingredients. I'm always curious to know what kind of things you just have to have around that you can make a meal out of any time or that you just just are, are a big part of your cooking. Yeah. Um, so for Shabbat, and that was such something that I really wanted to focus on with this book where I think a huge part of Jewish joy, Jewish celebration is this idea of ritual. And Shabbat is our biggest one because we have a holiday every Friday. And it's something that I didn't grow up with. My husband didn't grow up with it, but we came into it as young adults and fell in love with it because it is truly magical. Um, and it comes down to this fact where it's rooted in this idea of pausing and reflecting and extending gratitude and being present with loved ones and thinking about thinking about Torah and not thinking about Torah in the in the sense of of, of reading the, the Parshat, but th thinking of it in the sense of what are the moral and ethical dilemmas that are being discussed this week and how do they apply to our life or this world that we live in right now. And if you go to a really great temple or shul and, and you have services that do that, great. For us, we wanted to find a way to incorporate in our lives and the lives of our friends of this young secular Jewish community here in the city and really give people permission to kind of reclaim Judaism and reclaim this power that we have to 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 invest in ourselves and in our community and in our identity. And with that, the three things that I touch upon, again, because I'm not I'm not kosher, I'm not I'm not keeping Sharma Shabbos, but what I am making sure is that we talk about the why. Because as a Hebrew school educated Boy, I can tell you the prayers for the challah, the candles, the wine um, from rote memory. However, most people don't know the why. It's the same thing of when I would do my lives around when the book came out. I would ask every person, I was, I was like, can you sing Dainu? Everyone could sing Dainu, but half the people couldn't tell me what it meant. And to me, that's that disconnect that I want to bridge. And when it comes to Shabbat, it's you need challah. You need challah because A, it's delicious, and B, it is the conduit for everything. It is the conduit for your intention of hospitality, of putting that time and energy into baking bread for those you love. It is the conduit for actually nourishing people, both in a physical and spiritual sense. Um, and it's it's just the way that we, we create this intention of this is a meal. Bread is what makes it a meal. The candles are what are igniting this this like set amount of time in which nothing else matters that you get to be present and i am a person who is doing uh, running a mile a minute and constantly being distracted by everything and the bings and the the the, my, the buzzes of my phone and everything and to have something that really just becomes a, a conduit for a visceral reaction of like take a breath let it go this is yours and then the wine to sanctify. It's something that, like, for example, my husband and I, we don't drink. Sometimes for Shabbat, we pass around a bong. Sometimes for Shabbat, we do a million and one things. Whatever we're going to do to sanctify it in, in the sense of we're taking something mundane and turning it into something holy. And that can be with God or without God. You get to make that decision. You get to choose your own adventure. But what I don't want to see in which I feel like is happening in, in, in my generation is, is just this rejection, this idea of if it doesn't look like orthodoxy, if it doesn't look like how my parents told me it had to look like, then clearly I might as well not do it and I might as well not do it. And I might as well not have any ownership to it, that people have lost all sense of 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 really like just taking that freedom of being able to mold Judaism to keep it in your life. And that's why it's like when I think of, of a lot of the people who are in media and are Jewish and 
talk that way about their identity, it kind of hurts me. It actually, it, it doesn't kind of, it breaks it my heart. I find it offensive because they're taking their struggle or rejection to their identity and projecting it onto me or onto our community as a whole into the way we need to and act. For us, as exactly. if we all know that this is worthless. And I'm like, no, this tradition is about morphing. It's about creativity. It's about imagination. Because if it hadn't been, we wouldn't be here talking tonight about it. Yeah. Yeah. Even the medium that we're using right now has become a new chapter in how Jewish conversations, Jewish peoplehood, Jewish memories, and, and Jewish creativity goes to the next level. What, what recipe gives you the most joy? I mean, I, I touched upon the challah, so I won't do that because that one I'll say it the first one. No, I can't you, you, are, you are challah fetishist. Move, get, get next, next. Matzo ball soup. I think <laughs> the, 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 the funny thing is, and it's very common for many cultures, but when I think of one of the big differences between my husband and myself based on our upbringing is um, my sister and I, coming from an Ashkenazi family, have this obsession with soup with broth it is it is the food of life it is everything that we need for nourishment for comfort and i could have it every day and it's the every every ashkenazi jew in new york will say the same thing soup soup is it i think soup is it, it's because it's it's rooted in this idea of whatever you got we're going to throw it together and make something that's going to bring you health and comfort and warmth right right and of course like people need to think about sort of like the think about the ecosystems that our ancestors dwelt in and and you know for me this time of year is probably the most productive on a culinary level because it's the time of year that that you know it's the warmest yeah you know, it's it's the watermelon okra squash um season tomatoes hot peppers all the the building blocks of Africa, the African Atlantic diaspora and its foodways. Yeah, but in the same way, I think I feel very differently about Jewish food from the colder months. Cause I'm realizing, oh yeah, this is, you know, it's why, why do you have potatoes at Pesach? Because what, there was no damn parsley in Galicia and in, in Latvia and other places in the springtime. Are you kidding me? There, there were baby potatoes in some places. So that's what people did. And yeah. I bring all those to the table, you know, I bring the, the potatoes, sweet potatoes, uh, parsley, celery, all different forms of carpas. Because it, 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 it those tell different stories. Um, okay, so I'm going to delve into some of the Q&A because we have a few, only a few minutes. We answered some of these like on the way, but this question in particular, I wanted to leave. Um, what flavor combinations would most surprise uh -huh. The American Ashkenazi Jewish palette. So many. That was something that was super important when I was building out the pantry section of the book, where I wanted it to be reflective. I, I think that unless, and again, I did the best job that I could from my perspective, but it was so important to me that my pantry section reflected Jews from different cultures. And the idea of so many publications and this came up a few times during like pr marketing in which I, I pretty much said again like take it or leave it um it's always about substitutions it's always about whitewashing for uh the midwestern home cook who doesn't want to do get anything that's out of the ordinary at their local key food and to me that there's a place for that and that's great. And there are people that are really on that beat and doing that and that's wonderful. But if I'm going to be true to the Jewish community and these Jewish homes, it's not that hard to get right. dry Persian limes. It's not hard to get za'atar anymore. It's not right. hard to get sumac. It's not hard to get preserved lemons. These are all things that you could A, have delivered to your door in two days or most likely there is one place in your neighborhood in which you can get it or I, you can make some of these things yes yes 
That's a hundred percent true as well. But I get so many responses of like, what can I use instead of blank? And my response is no. I just say no. I I won't do it anymore because to me that's that's it, it it's just doing a disservice. You can't make gourmet sabzi, the most incredible Persian stew of, of beef and kidney beans and herbs, tons of chopped herbs, and you need these dried Persian limes whole, and they just release the most complex acidity and flavor. You can't use fresh lemon or lime juice to recreate. It's not the same. It's not the same. You know, it, it reminds me of a conversation I had on stage with um, Michael Salamanov. Child, mm. Mm. Anyways, he said something that was so profound. He said, the minute you substitute one thing to many, this stops being Jewish food. It stops being Israeli food. It stops being Ashkenazi food, Sephardi food, Mizrahi food. And it starts being it, just Italian or Greek or something else. Yeah. And yes, we know that there are intersections between um, Sephardi, Mizrahi food, and Bedouin food and Palestinian food and um, Persian food that are that is eaten by people who are Zoroastrian or Muslim. But even Moroccan food, there are subtle differences. Yes. Where you just and, and I'm telling you, if you don't if you don't recognize it, other folks gonna tell you. They're gonna tell you that's no, not our food. And it's same, it's like for example, Moroccan Jewish food is it has some similarities with Polish Jewish food. They both use sugar as a seasoning and not as a sweetener. There's a difference. Yeah. Um, and also, uh, what, what, when did you put garlic in or when did you put onion in? When did you use lamb? They didn't just use lamb or goat because it wasn't pork. It was because you're already in Morocco. There's no pork. They used it because there were certain preferences by the Jewish community where they were very localized and had their own origins in economics and ecosystems, et cetera. And so that's the kind of fine level I think people need to understand that these recipes emerge in. And it's and, it, and, it's, and I tell people all the time, if you're not going to put this on your pastrami and rye, then why the hell do you want to make this into something it's not? That's you know, it. you're, you're reversing the bris. It's not cool. It I, has to the culture. And the la- just that reminded me of, of just the, the last part, which is the idea of just the mindset we put when it comes to ingredients, when it comes to recipes and so many ingredients are considered foreign or exotic this i hate this term exotic because it's so commonplace i go to my my every on every family member of my husband has a freezer full of saffron has a a jar this big of sumac they have it all because this is what they use every day and in the same way that i think the way that the world has painted gefilte fish when you will go to a three michelin star french restaurant and find a fish mousse and pay hundreds of dollars for a tasting menu but yet a well done gefilte fish is deemed not good um and that's not to be said that that jarred gefilte fish and the industrialization of it has has been part of this but, but at its core it's all about the way that we position, the way that we talk about food. And if we're talking about these ingredients, these foods with this this gaze of it's not normal, it's not good, it's not something that the average person would have or should have, then you're just continuing the cycle of Italian, of Greek. And generic Italian, generic Greek, because when you go there, you find other stories that are there. Okay, so one question is, we have this, our mishpocha, our people has an has a interesting way with vegetables. Other than the cumin um, roasted carrots, could you name for us maybe two or three quick uh, things, recipes that you love that engage with vegetables that are plant-based? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the vegetable section was fun because it was things that I wanted to, I want this whole book to be ways that people can cook. And I, the one thing that was my biggest fear is that people would buy it and it would just sit on their shelf. And I remember one person told me once, maybe it was a, an editor or something, was like, you know, the average person makes one recipe from a cookbook. And that's the goal, is you want someone to at least make one recipe. And I said, that's bullshit. I was like, that's bullshit. I want people to cook through the <laughs> Like that's, I don't want, I don't need one recipe. I want this to be 
a cooking Bible for the young millennial Jew who's looking to reconnect to their identity. And with that came a section that was like, I wanted people to not make one recipe and feel like they were overwhelmed. Like I, I love, trust me, all hail Odalangi. But could you imagine making a full menu of Odalangi dishes? You'd spend three days in the kitchen. And I wanted to kind of give a group of vegetables that were going to blend with everything. So one of my favorites are the apricot glazed asparagus, which is a play. And it's it's just an anecdote on on Passover where there's always like a tray of sad limp asparagus and I just want to tell people like, no, you're going to sear it in a hot pan, steam it partially with some water. We're going to finish it with some apricot glaze because my aunt, I don't know why I didn't, but I should have put it in the book, but she always does this apricot glaze chicken based on a Joe Nathan recipe stuffed with matzo farfall. So right. delicious. Uh, and I wanted to have those same vibes. Same thing with the, I do these cauliflower wedges that are seasoned with, um, black pepper and coriander and then i top it with fried pistachios and golden raisins with warm spices and it's that combo of spiced and spicy from so much of my mother-in-law's cooking that just really permeates everything and people love it people like oh my god this is so good because we live in this society in which cinnamon is for pie cinnamon is in for meat right vegetables but it can be, and for so many cultures it is. And we have to open our minds to all of these things in the same way that I have been so blessed to be in an industry that constantly challenges me to be introduced to the way that different cultures use the same ingredients. And it's great. And sometimes I like it, and sometimes I'm not necessarily a huge fan, but I'm always looking at it from a place of admiration that this is part of people's culture and never from a yucking other people's yum. Yes, yes, yes. It's about that hunger again. It's about me, you know, adding to our sense of of the spiritual, our sense of the delicious, our sense of the good life, our sense of traditions that we have to preserve and pass on. So yeah, this has been really, really, really enjoyable. Um, this is the first time I've ever sort of like hosted, moderated a thing. You're, so you're like, the best person I could have asked for. Oh. Okay, Braze B. So I got that from you, by the way. Um, so uh, I just want to uh, say thank you to everybody. I want to get Jen Maxi back on because she has some final words for us. And I just want to say thank you, Jake, for an incredible um, hour of learning. We could do this forever, you know. We could, we have to do this in person sometime. I know. Cannot wait. Thank, Cannot wait. thank you. Well, thank you both so much. I mean, this was such an expansive conversation. It was so much more than a cookbook. Con- I mean, it was such an expansive conversation. You guys are fantastic. So we need uh, part two and three and four of this. Um, I will let people know that we did record this and in a few days, we'll put it up on our Skirball YouTube channel. So um, Michael, if you wanna go back and and, uh, and, and re-remember a lot of this stuff, you're, you're welcome to do that. And anyone else, please send it around to your friends who might've missed it. And please, of course, Jewish, you have to get uh, Jake's book. And we did put the link in the chat for you there. So our friends at Book Soup will take care of you there. And please visit us at skirball.org. We have more programs coming up. We are now open to the public. Yay, Yay. limited capacity. Um, We have a wonderful Ai Weiwei exhibit up right now. Um, We will have some live music this summer and we do expect to continue to, you know, kind of move toward more and more live programming, but still probably still do digital programming. So we're so happy you all joined us tonight. Jake and Michael, fantastic. We hope to see you both at the Skirball one of these days very soon. It would be our pleasure to welcome you back. So thank you very much and everyone take good care. Bye. Thank you.